This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Numbers chapter 18 this morning, and um, Numbers chapter 18, there we go, Numbers chapter 18, um, and honestly in these chapters I think we're just, we're going to kind of do some a little bit of touch and go on them. Um, I'll read the first seven verses of chapter 18, um, and then we'll kind of just be in and out of the, the chapter a bit. Um, Numbers chapter 18, starting with verse 1. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house, with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, of the tribe of thy father, bring thou with me, that they may be joined unto thee, and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. And they shall keep the charge uh, the charge and the charge of the tabernacle, uh, excuse me, of all the tabernacle, only they shall not come nigh the vessels of, of the sanctuary and the altar, that, they, that neither they nor ye also die. And they shall be joined unto thee, and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle. And a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. And ye shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. And I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among uh, the children of Israel. To, to you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Therefore, thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar, and wear in the veil, and ye shall serve. I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of, a, of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. All right, definitely not some of the easiest <laughs> scripture for us to connect with right off the bat, but let's have a word of prayer, and we will jump in here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we dig through uh, Numbers 18 and 19 this morning, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to truth, and would you give us a glimpse into what you were doing back then with your people and the priests, and help us to give an, have an appreciation for you uh, in your son's name. Amen. Um, as I was reading this, there's an element I forgot to put in the handout. Um, the language that's used here of the priest keeping the the tabernacle or, or the, the temple them keeping and preserving it, where does that language of keeping something like that first show up in Scripture? In fact, it's only, there, there's a strong parallel in the language between this passage and a previous story in Scripture. Yes, Adam and, Adam and Eve were to tend and keep the garden, the same language as the Le Levites were to keep, and the priests were to keep uh, the tabernacle. Um, all that being said, let's uh, back up a little bit, because just jumping in here, and it's been a long time, does anybody remember what happened in the previous chapter, um, chapter 17? It's been a long time. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. If you look at the heading on the paper, you'll probably figure it out. Chapter 17, we have Aaron's rod budding. Okay, so kind of the story in the big picture so far is they're in this wilderness of Paran journey. Um, there's this rebellion in chapter 16, the rebellion of Korah 
and they're claiming Moses has taken too much upon himself, then in response to that rebellion, one, there's a whole bunch of people that die, then there's some complaining again, and Moses, under God's direction, has each leader from the tribes bring their rod or their walking stick, their staff. They bring that in. It's left in the presence of the Lord overnight. Then by morning, Aaron's rod buds, and it produces almonds, and they're, you know, just presumably almonds that are laying on the floor or whatever from his rod buds, signifying and saying, God has chosen Aaron and his line, his family, as the ones to be the priests. So it's kind of this confirmation of what God's doing. Uh, in that story and in some of the things going on there, there was a rebellion and there was a fire or lightning that came from, out from the tabernacle and killed a bunch of people. Okay, all that is kind of the groundwork for these chapters. Because these chapters kind of, to us, they seem very boring. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but it's, they're just, they don't connect well with us. Um, but these chapters are in light of God confirming his choice to Aaron, uh, of Aaron as the one to be a part of the priesthood and to minister to the Lord. Uh, these chapters are giving some details on that. So in verses 1 to 7, we have listed out some of the duties of the priests. I, this was some of the most difficult passages for me to study because it was just, I felt compli it compli I felt like it was complicated and hard to understand. One commentator was describing how the, the priests within the certain family, they like protected the sanctuary from the inside, but the Levites were the ones that they couldn't go in, but they took care of stuff on the outside. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can see that in these passages. I'm not, I'm not fully there. Um, Dennis Cole makes a note. He said, the present chapter readdresses and expands the role of Levites as guardians of the tabernacle. They were pre to preserve the sanctity of the holy place and to prevent encroachment from Israelites outside the Levitical line, as well as from the rebellious and unclean Israelites, even from within, such as Korah and his associates. Uh, what's unique about this chapter is in verse 1, who is it addressed to? Who does the Lord speak to here? Aaron. There's only other one, only other one passage so in the story so far where God directly addresses Aaron, and that's in Leviticus 10. Usually, who does God address? Moses, or Moses and Aaron, you know, together. But usually, Moses is involved. So there's a, a direct link here uh, to Aaron. Um, there's some funny language, it's kind of funny to us, that they bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. Let's unpack that a little bit. What do you think that means? To bear or carry the iniquity of the sanctuary. Is is the sanctuary like sinful or is something wrong or what does this mean? Is there Okay, good. Yeah, okay, so this is, you have to think in the realm of sacred space. This space has to stay holy or clean or set apart, right? And so they're bearing the responsibility of keeping the tabernacle and the compound holy, separate, set apart. Yeah. Yes. But it's not in the sense that God needs protection. Okay, that, that's a good distinction, too. It's not that God needs protection. It's that who needs the protection? The people, okay? If they enter into this area and they are unclean, they are at risk of death. So God is literally using the, the priesthood to protect the people. Um, a couple of comments on that. Um, so the offense, this is... To bear the iniquity of the sanctuary is like the offenses against the sanctuary, whatever it would be that make it unclean, or against the priesthood. Uh, number two here from Eugene Merrill, he says, The phraseology, they shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, emphasizes this point. In a very real sense, the gift of the priesthood was a gift of grace to the nation of Israel, whereby they might live in holiness and righteousness in their relationship to God and not suffer death as a result of violating his holiness. 
God is providing a way with the priests here that people can live close to God in his presence without his presence killing them. Okay? Um, so, kind of sidelight, but this helps bring back, why would the people be afraid of the tabernacle anyway? Why would they, they be afraid to get close to God? Okay, yes, and, and what happened at Mount Sinai? Okay, they were they were they were scared to the point that they said, Moses, you go up, we don't want to, you go up and you come tell us what God says, okay? So they were scared and, and God had put bounds on the mount to where they, they shouldn't come up. Also, just in the preceding couple chapters, um the chieftains who had led the rebellion, fire came out of the tabernacle and killed them. So Hmm, yeah, I mean, if, if you saw that happen, you might be a little nervous about getting too close to that tent or structure, okay? Um, so this is part of, the priests were there because there is a way to approach God. There is a way to come to God, and God was, but God is holy and separate. And just like the sun, it's a good thing, but if you get too close to the sun, you burn up and die. That's, God is holy, he's separate, he's unique. Uh, verse 6 highlights how this is, it was called the gift of the priesthood. Now, why would it be called a gift? Why would the priesthood be considered a gift? Everybody's quiet today. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's looking at it as, as a, a gift to the priests. Um, maybe I wasn't clear. The gift is actually the priests are like a gift to the people. Okay? So how are the gift, the priests, the priesthood, a gift to the people? Okay, yes, it provides a way to, to basically for God to commune with his people through this priesthood. It's providing access to the to God through the priest through the sacrificial system is that kind of makes sense God is an agnostic believes that God created the world set everything in motion but he has nothing to do with the world he just kind of sits by and watches okay that is clearly not the god of scripture the god of scripture is a god who interacts with his people and creation and here he's the nation of Israel, he has brought them out of Egypt. He's established them as a new nation. He's established a covenant with him. And now he wants to dwell in their midst. But in order to do that without killing them all off, the priesthood serves as kind of that mediator, that buffer. They will dwell close to the presence of God. They will deal with the holy things. They will keep his, his temple clean, if, as it were. Uh, and when you think of sacred space... This may not be the best illustration, but think of it like your refrigerator, okay? You want to keep that closed, right? Why? It keeps it cold. It keeps the cold in, right? And you you might put food in there that's cold, but there's other things that are cold that you're like, I'm not putting that in the same thing that I eat food out of. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's a sacred. It's a set-apart space. It's a unique space. Um, and so that's not the best illustration, but that's kind of what's happening here is the Levites and the priests, they're keeping the tabernacle temple space unique, special, holy. Um, verses 8, comments, questions there? Anybody? And a lot of this is, is just outside of our Western thinking, so it's kind of complicated. Um, we then have in verses 8 to 32, uh, support for the priests and the Levites. So in chapter 18, verses 8 to 20, we have meal offerings and sin offerings and trespass offerings and peace offerings and fruit offerings. And this could get really, this is where it's like uh, you kind of bog down in the details. And the reason is like certain priests and Levites could eat certain offerings and certain ones could only eat this and certain ones only the males could eat. Um, basically, of the offerings and whatnot that were being offered to God, a portion of those offerings were allowed for God's people, i.e. the priests and Levites, to eat. Okay, It was how they were fed. 
Um, you're smiling. You have something going on? Yes, very much so. Yeah, it, it's a technical manual for the, for them. Yes. Um, so I, Wiersbe is not one I quote a lot. He's a great commentator. He's very conservative. He's very readable. Uh, he had this to say: he "Said some of the fruit food, excuse me, only the priests could eat, but much of it could be shared with their families. However, whoever in the priestly family ate of the sacrifices given to God had to be ceremonially clean and treat the food with reverence because it had been sanctified by the present uh, by being presented to God." Another thing going on in these chapters is um, this covenant of salt. And this is kind of an interesting concept. The, the various sacrifices and offerings would be made with salt. Now, why do you think that was? There's a couple things going on with this, but... Oh, that would actually... That's kind of close. Okay. Salt does preserve, but they put salt with it, and then they're burning it up on the altar anyway, or they're eating it soon after. So, you, you, um, a couple things going on with the salt. Any other? Th That's a good, good point to note. Um, on the side of page three here, the biblical phrase uh, for a two-way covenant agreement. Um, the in inviolability of which was symbolized by salt. It was a Middle Eastern way of saying there's bread and salt between us, meaning there's a relationship and it's confirmed by a covenant sharing a meal. That's one aspect of this salt because there's a covenant relationship between them and God. And so to have bread and salt with a meal was kind of like you're, you're creating a bond. But there's another way to look at the salt, and I'm not sure that it's not out of line either. A covenant of salt also would be tied to a military thing where when you would conquer a foreign land, they would often take salt and literally sow salt on their fields. Now, why would they sow salt on people's fields? Yep, they'd sterilize it and kill everything off. It would literally destroy their agricultural production. And so there might be an element of, of these covenant of salts also being associated with like a bond of, if you break this agreement, your your fields, your goods, your produce, it will be destroyed. You know, there's a, there's a consequence for breaking the agreement. Um, I'm not sure which is the best way to look at that, so I kind of keep both on the table. Um, they do. Israel has been given this unique and special relationship with the Lord, um, and the Levites here, they do deal with this covenant of salt, um, this relationship they have with him. Um, Verse 18, 21 to 32, we have uh, more general instructions for the Levites. Okay, so the priests are like a subcategory of Levites. Um, and there we have more instructions of tithing. So they were to receive a tithe from what the people brought into the sanctuary. And usually when we think of a tithe, especially Old Testament tithe, what are we thinking of as far as percentage-wise? What's a tithe? It's a tenth, Okay. However, you jump into this discussion, how much did the average Israelite, if they followed the, the laws as laid out in, in the Torah, or, or Book of Moses, how much would they actually be giving of their income? Yeah, yeah, roughly 30. A number I've seen a lot is 23%. And there's a long discussion of why it's 23 as opposed to 30. But there was three different tithes. So the first tithe is... is there's a tithe to the Levites, and that's mentioned here, for their support, and their, because they don't have, what did the Levites not have that every other tribe had? Yeah, they didn't have any property, okay? So they lived in special set-apart cities for them. They functioned as a as, as supporting role to the priesthood, but they didn't have property. They couldn't develop and, and you know, expand and they were fo their their job was focused on tending to the things of the Lord. So the other tribes would give to this tribe to support these Levites. So that's 10%. Then in Deuteronomy 14, we read about a tithe eaten before the Lord. And this was where you would literally tithe, but this was you, you would take and you would 
there was a, a community slash ritual slash sacrificial meal you would have before the Lord, and it was something that you would you would eat this meal in celebration of the Lord, but it was part of your tithes to that. So in some ways, it's almost like a tithe. It's almost like a tithe to. I don't know, your spiritual experience, uh, maybe, I don't know how to think of this. It's like a tithe to money you're putting in towards things that develop your relationship and further your relationship with the Lord. In a modern context, you might think of like setting some money aside to go to a retreat or go to camp or to, you know, buy some spiritual literature or whatever. Um, Now, again, I'm not taking this all the way to the New Testament, all right? This is... These are kind of Old Testament stuff happening here. The third tithe was given once every three years, and that was given to the poor. Okay, so again, I don't want to bog down in all the different tithes. And there's a reason there's lots of discussion on why it's 23% or 30% or whatever. As New Testament believers, though, what do we do with this? Are there things we can learn from these different tithes? Yes, very much so. Uh, Paul makes a note in Galatians. He says, hey, pay pay your pastor. You know, he's working to you in spiritual things. You know, take care of him in physical things or material things, okay? So there's that element, all right? And I don't like to speak on that much. That's just awkward. I think there's also an element that sometimes as New Testament believers, we can get we can so focus our, our giving on just the church that we, we're so tight up that we don't always have to give to those around us in need. Whether that's a, a neighbor, whether that's a friend, whether that's um, someone you know we know. Um, and there's, there, I think there's a value in, in stopping and maybe putting some money aside in your budget or how you think of, I want to have some money set aside to help people. And what that does is when a situation comes up, if you set some money aside, it helps to give you that frame of reference of, okay, I have, I've prepared for this. I've planned for this. Um, this was done actually by uh, Hudson Taylor's parents, um, James Taylor Sr. Uh, they were living in a town where there was no church. He was working uh, a job, and they were setting aside, not a tenth, but a ninth. They were setting aside money, but since there was no church, what they did with that money was they would use that to help the poor and needy in their area. And I, you know, where you apply that specifically, that's up to you. I am not stepping into that. That's that's for you specifically, but it's something to think about. Um, and and lastly, there is the element of the tithe before the Lord. And this was a spiritual experience. This was a spiritual. I don't want to say retreat. I I feel like I'm already adding New Testament or modern terms to it. But it was a time when you went before the presence of the Lord, and they did this. And, and, and for us to set aside some money or funds to, to do things that help us focus for a week or, for, or a short period of time on the Lord, I think that's appropriate as well. So, again, I don't want to bear down on any one of these too much. But um, there is a giving back of our resources to the Lord that happens here in the Old Testament. All right, that covers chapter 18. Chapter 19, this deals mostly with the provisions or means to be clean or to keep yourself clean. Um, You don't enter into the presence of God with anything of the stain or or stench of death upon you. This is the God of life. You don't enter into his presence with anything dead. this is where we have the instructions about the red heifer. And so normally an animal's color and these sacrifices didn't matter. They did have to be blemished, but this one had to be red. And Gordon Winham says that this was red to symbolize blood. Um, you ever seen a red heifer? Have you? Oh. Okay. So I'm... They talk about... As I'm reading through, com- right, they talk about how incredibly rare 
these red heifers are. And I don't, I'm not a rancher. Are they fairly rare to you guys or? No. Oh, no, okay. Right. Well, and the thing is, maybe they're referring to something slightly different than what we call a red heifer today, too. So, yes, so they are bred, yeah, so I'm going to bring this into the conversation, which makes me think what they're referring to as a red heifer is different than what we mean by a red heifer. It was in Missouri somewhere, they specially, they finally got a breed that, that qualified under Jewish law or whatever they understood it to be as a red heifer, and so they had a red heifer. And they thought, we can now reinstitute the temple sacrifice system because we have a red heifer. The problem is, they got it over to Israel, they got all this process going, and they found three white hairs on its tail. And so, nope, not spotless. It's out. So, I'm guessing if it's that rare that they're trying to raise it like in Missouri and ship it to Israel, could you imagine what shipping a cow over there would cost? <laughs> um, I, I imagine they're... What's that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't just put that thing in the cargo hold, I suppose. <laughs> but um, all that to say, this is very unique and is, it's, it's very um, special, all right? <clears throat> so it was to be spotless without defect. This sacrifice would be burnt outside of the camp, which was a bit unique. The blood was not drained before the sacrifice, like all the other sacrifices. Um, the blood would be part then of the ashes. Then a, a, a priest who was clean would pick up the ashes and, and, and gather it all together. At, um, and as part of the burning, they would put wood or uh, usually cedar, um, <clears throat> sorry, cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet into the fire. Now, this is getting complicated real quick, and I just put a section from David Zook's commentary in, because I thought he did a really good job of just bringing this to focus. He said in, Le in Leviticus 14, 4-6, each of these three items are used in the cleansing of a leper, uh, this cleansing ceremony for a leper. Each of these has a special significance. Cedar is extremely resistant to, resistant to disease and rot, and is well known for its quality and preciousness. These properties may be the reason for it included here as well as a symbolic reference to the wood of the cross. Some even think the cross Jesus was crucified on was made of cedar. Hyssop was used not only with the cleansing ceremony for lepers, but also Jesus was offered drink from hyssop, a hyssop branch, on the cross. And when David said, Purge me of hyssop in Psalm 51.7, he was admitting that he was as bad as a leper. Scarlet, the color of blood, pictures the cleansing blood of Jesus on the cross. Scarlet was used in the veil and curtains of the tabernacle, in the garments of the high priest, the covering for the table of showbread, the sign of Rahab's salvation, remember the scarlet rope, and the color of the mocking king's robe put on Jesus and at his torture by the soldiers. So there might be some connections here. You, the, those three things going into the ashes, they would then take these ashes, gather them up, as verse 10 of chapter 9 describes, They'd mix them in water, and they'd use this as water mixture, potion, you might call it. I don't, potion kind of sounds bad. It starts to sound like a magical, mystical. Um, but this was now part of how you would become clean with this potion. So then anybody who had made contact with the dead bought with this. Okay, part of this is where Catholics get the idea of holy water, and they like bring that into... <laughs> So, so, and this this is Old Testament. This is we don't need this today. Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. Um, but as verses eleven to sixteen describe, if you touch a dead animal, you touch a dead person, you're now unclean, and you don't waltz back into God's presence. So this red heifer liquid <laughs> of the ashes was used as part of a ritual to make you clean again, uh, and. <clears throat> Failure to become clean and enter into God's presence leads to death. But also in verse 20 of chapter 19, it says, But the man shall 
that shall not, uh, but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of the separation had, that's that red heifer water, hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. The problem is not if you touch a dead person or a dead animal. Because part of life, when somebody dies, what do you do? You have to bury them. You have to touch them. You have to get involved. Okay, That's not the problem. The problem is the person who is unclean, and they don't want to get clean. They don't care to get clean so they can enter back into God's presence. They are content staying outside of God's presence. That's where the problem lies. Um, and so as one person writes, this shows that uncleanness, uncleanliness cannot correct itself. The unclean man will not just, quote-unquote, become clean. He must do something. And he must do what God says must be done in order to be clean. His own plans or schemes for cleansing mean nothing. And lastly here, uncleanliness was easily transmitted, but cleanliness had to be deliberately sought. I think there's, there's something to remember here. Usually when we do something wrong in life, we kind of like to let time sweep the memory away or hope that it does so. And that doesn't always work. <laughs> in fact, usually we need to go make things right. And whether it's a confession and making things right with the Lord and then going to other people, um, the different levels of that are uh, kind of depend on, on what type of offense it was and who was involved. But Israel was to deliberately seek a clean, close, personal relationship with God. God wanted to communicate to them. He was making um, himself available to them through the priesthood, through the sacrificial system, through the red heifer as a means to cleaning yourself or, or becoming clean. Um, all this was set up so they could have access to God. But, as verse 20 points out, there was anticipation that some people, they wouldn't care. And I think we see that even today in our own culture. So, Comments, questions there as we close out? Again, not necessarily one of the easiest passages of Scripture. Uh, a little bit hard for us. And I found it very difficult to study through because there were so many rabbit trails and, and weeds. And I'm trying to, to go quickly, and I don't always succeed at that. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we're thankful that as we see here through a different context and a different time, your concern and your focus is that you can dwell with your people and be approachable. You can be um, accessible to your people, to commune with them, to lead and guide them. We're thankful as New Testament believers that we have Christ who has split the veil, that, uh, that veil of separation, and we can all openly come boldly before the throne of grace. Our sin has been fully dealt with, and we can enter into your presence wherever we are. Lord, we ask that you would help give us a sensitivity to sin within our own hearts and lives. Would we desire to live and walk clean? And when and when we find ourselves unclean, we ask that you would help us draw close to you, confess any sin that's wrong, or sometimes just the lethargic attitude of we get so busy and caught up with the things of life that we haven't focused on you for a while. Lord, I ask that you would help draw us each to you even this week. And I ask all this in your son's name. Amen.